Finally, as promised, a special comment on the latest version of H.R. 3590, the Senate health care reform bill. To again quote Churchill after Munich, as I did six nights ago on this program, I will begin by saying the most unpopular and most unwelcome thing, that we have sustained a total and unmitigated defeat without a war. Last night on this program, Howard Dean said that with the appeasement of Mr. Lieberman of Connecticut by the abandonment of the Medicare buy-in, he could no longer support H.R. 3590. Dr. Dean's argument is informed, cogent, heartbreaking, and unanswerable. Seeking the least common denominator, Senator Reid has found it, especially the least part. This is not health. This is not care. This is certainly not reform. I bless the Sherrod Browns and Ron Wydens and Jay Rockefellers and Sheldon Whitehouses and Anthony Weiners and all the others who have fought for real reform. And I bleed for the pain inflicted upon them and their hopes. They have done their jobs. They have served their nation. But through circumstances beyond their control, they are now seeking to reanimate a corpse killed by the Republicans and by a political game played in the Senate and in the White House by men and women who have now proved themselves poorly equipped for that fight. The men of the current moment have lost to the mice of history. They must now not make the defeat worse by passing a hollow shell of a bill just for the sake of a big stage signing ceremony. This bill slowly bled to death by the political equivalent of the leeches that were once thought state-of-the-art medicine is now little more than a series of microscopically minor tweaks of a system which is the real-life, here-and-now version of the malarkey of the town haulers. The American insurance cartel is the death panel, and this Senate bill does nothing to destroy it, nor even to satiate it. It merely decrees that our underprivileged, our sick, our elderly, our middle class can be fed into it as human sacrifices to the great maw of corporate voraciousness at a profit per victim of 10 cents on the dollar instead of the current 20. Even before the support columns of reform were knocked down one by one with the kind of passive defense that would embarrass a touch football player, single payer, the public option, the Medicare buy-in, before they vanished, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the part of the bill that would require you to buy insurance unless you could prove you could not afford it would cost a family of four with a household income of $54,000 a year, 17% of that income, $9,000 a year just for the insurance. That was with a public option. That was with some kind of check on the insurance companies. That was before, as Howard Dean pointed out, the revelation that the cartel will still be able to charge older people more than others, will at the least now be able to charge much more, maybe 50% more, for people with pre-existing conditions. Pre-existing conditions. You know, like being alive. You have just agreed to purchase a product. If you do not, you will be breaking the law and subject to a fine. You have no control over how much you will pay for that product. The government will have virtually no control over how much the company will charge for that product. The product is designed like the Monty Python sketch about the insurance company's never pay policy. Which, you know, if you never claim, is very worthwhile. But you had to claim, and, well, there it is. And who do we have to blame for this? Well, there are enough villains to go around. Men and women who, in a just world, would be the next to get sick and have to sell their homes or their memories or their futures just to keep themselves alive, just to keep their children alive against the implacable enemy of American society, the insurance cartel. Mr. Grassley of Iowa has lied and fomented panic and fear. Mr. Dement of South Carolina has forgotten he represents people and not just a political party. Mr. Baucus of Montana has operated as a virtual agent for the industry he is charged with regulating. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska has not only derailed reform, he has tried to exploit it to overturn a Supreme Court decision that is, in this context, frankly, none of his goddamned business. They say they have done what they have done for the most important the most fiscally prudent, the most gloriously phrased, the most inescapable of reasons, but mostly they have done it for the money. Lots and lots of money from the insurance companies and the pharmacological companies and the other health care companies who have slowly, deliberately, and effectively taken this country over. Which brings us to Mr. Lieberman of Connecticut, the one man at the center of this farcical perversion of what a government is supposed to be. Out of pique, out of revenge, out of betrayal of his earlier, wiser, saner self, he has sold untold hundreds of thousands of us into pain and fear and privation and slavery for money. He has been bought and sold by the insurance lobby. 
He has become a senatorial prostitute. And sadly, the President of the United States has not provided the leadership his office demands. He has badly misjudged the country's mood at all ends of the spectrum. There is no middle to coalesce here, sir. There are only the uninformed, the bought off, and the vast suffering majority for whom the urgency of now is a call from a collection agency or a threat of rescission of policy or a warning of expiration of services. Sir, your hands-off approach, while nobly intended and perhaps yet someday applicable to the reality of an improved version of our nation, enabled the national humiliation that was the town halls and the insufferable Neanderthalian stupidity of Congressman Wilson and the street-walking of Mr. Lieberman. Instead of continuing this snipe hunt for the endangered and possibly extinct creature bipartisanship, you need to push the Republicans around or cut them out or both. You need to threaten Democrats like Baucus and the others with the ends of their careers in the party. Instead, those Democrats have threatened you, and the Republicans have pushed you and cut you out. Mr. President, the line between compromise and compromised is an incredibly fine one. Any reform bill enrages the right and provides it with the war cry around which it will rally its mindless legions in the midterms and in 12. But this Republican knee-jerk inflexibility provides an incredible opportunity to you, sir, and an incredible license. On April 6, 2003, I was approached by two drunken young men at a baseball game, and one of them started to ask for an autograph, and the other one stopped him by shouting, screw him, he's a liberal. This program had been on the air for three weeks. It had to that point consisted entirely of brief introductions to correspondents in Iraq or to military analysts. There had been no criticism, no political analysis, no commentary. I had not covered news full-time for more than four years. I could not fathom on what factual basis I was being called a liberal, let alone being sworn at for being such. Only later did it dawn on me that it didn't matter why, and it didn't matter that they were doing it. It only mattered that... If I was going to be mindlessly criticized for anything, the reaction would be identical whether I did nothing that engendered it or whether I stood for something that engendered it. Mr. President, they're calling you a socialist, a communist, a Marxist. You could be further to the right on this than Reagan and this health care bill, as Howard Dean put it here last night, this bailout for the insurance industry, that sure invites the Reagan comparison. And they will still call you names. Sir, if they're going to call you a socialist, no matter what you do, you have been given full, unfettered freedom to do what you know is just. The bill may be the ultimate political manifesto, or it may be the most delicate of compromises. The firestorm will be the same. So why not give the haters, as the cliche goes, something to cry about? But concomitant with that is the reaction from Democrats and independents. You have riven them, sir. Any bill will engender criticism, but this bill costs you the left and anybody who now has to pony up 17% of his family's income to buy this equivalent of medical mobster protection money. Some, speaking for you, sir, have called the public option a fetish. They may be right, but to stay with this uncomfortable language, this bill is less fetish and more bondage. Nothing short of your re-election and the re-election of dozens of Democrats in the House and the Senate hinges in large part on this bill. Make it palatable or make it go away or make yourself ready, not merely for a horrifying campaign in 2012, but for the distinct possibility also of a primary challenge. Befitting the season, sir, these are not the shadows of the things that will be, but the shadows of the things that may be. But at this point, Mr. President, only you can make certain of that. There is only one redemption possible. The mandate in this bill under which we are required to buy insurance must be stripped out. The bill now is little more than a legally mandated delivery of the middle class and those whose dreams of joining it slip ever further away into a kind of Chicago stockyards of insurance. Make enough money to take care of yourself and your family and you must buy insurance on the insurer's terms or face a fine. This provision must go. It is, above all else, immoral and a betrayal of the people who elected you, sir. You must now announce that you will veto any bill lacking an option or buy-in but containing a mandate. And Senator Reid, put the public option back in, or the Medicare buy-in, or both, or single payer for that matter. Let Lieberman and Ben Nelson and Baucus and the Republicans vote their lack of conscience and preclude the 60 eyes. Let them commit the political suicide instead of you. Let Mr. Lieberman kill this bill.
then turned to his Republican friends, only to find out they hate him more than the Democrats do. Let him stagger off the public stage to go work for the insurance industry, as if he is not doing that now. And then, Mr. Reid, take every worthwhile provision of health care reform you legally can and pass it via reconciliation whenever and however you can. And by the way, a Medicare buy-in can be legally passed via reconciliation. The Senate bill with the mandate must be defeated, if not in the Senate, then in the House. Health care reform that benefits the industry at the cost of the people is intolerable, and there are no moral constructs in which it can be supported. And if still the bill and this heinous mandate become law, there is yet further reaction required. I call on all those whose conscience urges them to fight to use the only weapon that will be left to us if this bill, as currently constituted, becomes law. We must not buy federally mandated insurance if this cheesy counterfeit of reform is all we can buy. No single payer, no sale. No public option, no sale. No Medicare buy-in, no sale. I am one of the self-insured, albeit by choice, and I hereby pledge that I will not buy this perversion of health care reform. Pass this at your peril, Senators. And sign it at yours, Mr. President. I will not buy this insurance. Brand me a lawbreaker if you choose. Find me if you will. Jail me if you must. But if the Medicare buy-in goes, but the mandate stays, the people who fought so hard and so sincerely to bring sanity to this system must kill this mutated, ugly version of their dream because those elected by us to act for us have forgotten what must be the golden rule of health care reform. It is the same rule to which physicians are bound by oath. First, do no harm.